All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rambling, your everyday life with Fran and Angela. Angela, this is so fun. We are, once again, my friend, we are not (laughs) together in our home. No. Uh, we still don't have a soundboard at Union, but it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But here we are today. We're all side by side. I know. And and we are in a fancy studio. We are in somewhere <laughs> so super fun. And I am so glad that we have the guests that we have today. And I meant to look up what episode Amanda Chenault oh, I know. was on. But we have, we have Amanda's husband. Mm-hmm. Mr. Amanda. Mr. Amanda <laughs> Chenault. She, she will love that. <laughs> His name is Will Chenault. <laughs> he, he's a big deal. He is a big In deal. In addition to being married to Amanda. <laughs> I'm so glad that we have him today. So, Will, welcome Thank to the you. show, Thank Mr. You. Amanda. I, I will go by that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tell everybody what you want us to know about you. Okay. In the context of what we're going to talk about, please, please give us a professional job description too. (laughs) (laughs) But tell us, tell the, tell everybody what we need to know about Mr. Amanda. Okay. Mr. Amanda. (laughs) (laughs) That's what the title of this podcast. Mr. Amanda. (laughs) (laughs) This is awesome. Okay. (laughs) Mr. Amanda has been uh, married for, uh, here in just a few weeks, 24 years. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. And three daughters, uh, 19, 16, and 12. Um, We've lived in Jackson for 10 years now. Kind of professionally what I do, I'm I'm the soul care pastor uh, at here at Fellowship. Um, We're actually in my office, and so that's why I say here at Fellowship. But, um... So people often say, what is a soul care pastor? And so essentially it's maybe easier to say counseling pastor. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've just had the privilege over a decade of, you know, entering into the lives of so many people um, and just helping them process through the things in their life and their point of need. And it's just been a wonderful uh, calling and just a rich life of being able to um, have depth and intimacy with people. And we're going to talk about story today, but entering in deeply into the story of others is really a a holy calling. And so in addition to what I do here at Fellowship, I'm also part-time. I'm in with the Pratt Clinic and there's eight clinicians um, uh, with with Dr. Pepper Pratt. And so I am. Can we just pause and say Dr. Pepper one more time? Dr. Pepper. Yes. He is. He is awesome. And Dr. Pepper. Pepper. (laughs) And so I'm there uh, one day a week. Uh, so our, our staff uh, day off is Friday. And so I take that for my counseling there that's outside of fellowship. And I've um, been doing that for four years now. So it's really a rich, good, um, you know, love what I do. That's awesome. Have you, like, did you, when you were 15, go, oh, this is what I want to do with my life? How did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah. I had no idea at 15 years old. Um, I really, I, I didn't have a lot of idea. I kind of grew up in a home that, um, you know, there was an expectation that you're going to, you know, be successful and do things, but, you know, didn't necessarily at 15 have this trajectory and career path, but I didn't come to Christ until I was 17 years old. Mm-hmm. And so, um, when I did come to Christ, I was really connected to a local church. And so it was through those relationships that I realized just, you know, I, I wanted to be with people Mm -hmm. and I knew that my gifts were, you know, being with people. And I I can look back on my childhood and I've always been very curious about people's lives, Mm -hmm. always been very, very observant of people um, and just kind of a fascination with people. And so I could see that very early on. Um, and, uh, so it really was, you know, through the course of really, I went to seminary, I was a part of, uh, other staff roles. Um, but I was, I was a part of a church planting ministry. I was a church planter for a season and a period of time. And I thought that's what God had called me to do. Um, we went through this program, uh, where we were trained through fellowship Bible church in little rock. And, you know, I, I love the idea of church planting and multiplying churches and all of that. And, and I realized when I got into that work, 
it was not who God called me to be. It was David wearing Saul's armor. Mm. It, I mean, it was just, it was not me. Mm. And it was through the course of that that was the catalyst that I can vividly remember I was sitting uh, in line waiting to pick my kids up from school and I was reading The Sacred Romance by John Eldridge and Brent Curtis, which is really kind of a top five book for me. And I I remember reading and said, I want to give my life to this kind of work. Wow. I, I graduated in counseling. My undergrad was in counseling. And so, you know, I, I kind of had that already. Yeah. Um, but never necessarily, you know, thought I would be like a, a therapist that was in private practice. I love the church. I love discipleship. I love the people of God. And so, um, just, you know, I could talk a long time about the core, about opportunities, mm-hmm. but I think probably one of the biggest influences in my life was when I got to train with Dr. Larry Crabb. Mm-hmm. That was the thing that, um, during that season, I was reintroduced to Larry and to his works. I had read those in seminary, but it was like, this is what I want to give my life to. Oh, that's and so I had awesome. the opportunity to train with him mm-hmm. and spend time with him. And for those that don't know, Larry Crabb was kind of the father of uh, Christian psychology mm-hmm. um, and authored 40 plus books wow. and just was very, very well known within the Christian counseling world. Mm. And, um, you know, meeting Larry and spending time with him really changed the trajectory of my life. Oh, listen, you just never know. Yeah. Mm -mm. You just never know. One person can make a big difference. Okay. I think that who you are and and what you bring to um, our church and this Mm -hmm. church is just one of the greatest gifts. It's just so beautiful. And I'm so thankful that you're here. Um, Talk to us about, um, because it was new to me, these story groups. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I say it all the time. As soon as I get done with Fellowship U, which I feel like <laughs> is going to be 17 years from now, mm-hmm. but it's not. It's not. I'm, We're in year two. We're, We're getting there, two. Fran. I want to participate in story groups. Tell us what they are. And I know that it doesn't, we're not talking about, you know, this is exclusive for people that are here in Jackson that are a part of fellowship. No, no, no. I'm curious about just stories Mm -hmm. in general and why they matter. And if you cannot participate in a story group, which is going to be 98% Mm -hmm. of the people that Mm -hmm. listen to this, then what can you tell us that helps us figure out what is my story? What do I do with it? How do I explore my story in a healthy way? Yeah. Well, it really started through my time with Larry, but also dovetailing in uh, a man named Dr. Dan Allender um, and and the influence of Dr. Allender. I've had the privilege of training and studying under uh, Dr. Allender as well. And and so just the, the premise of a story group is uh, a six week experience where we want you to learn about your life story in large in light of God's larger story. So it really is a spiritual practice. Um, and I talk about the very first week about the, you know, John Calvin talked about the double knowledge, knowledge of God and knowledge of self. Mm-hmm. And within conservative evangelical circles, we, we definitely revere the knowledge of God as we should. I mean, that's crucial and important. But then the knowledge of self often goes overlooked and so, because it feels too psychology, mm-hmm. you know, it feels mm-hmm. too counsel mm-hmm. And yet what we also know is most of the damage done in Christian ministries is relational damage. Mm-hmm. It is leaders who um, have not known the shaping events of their life. And so, you know, they, they don't have a category for relational sin. And so you think about, I mean, we, we can see with the landscape within evangelical culture of leaders who have harmed people because they didn't know their shadow. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the things that have shaped them. You know, um, if we don't tell our story, our story will tell us. Yeah. And so there is that part of knowing this is crucial for discipleship. You know, this is not just psychological or counseling. This is discipleship. And so knowing that just, realizing we have all these other venues within the church of knowing God and that's crucial and that's important. But where is the reality that we know the shaping events of our own lives? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, how has my family of origin impacted who I am today? When I say family of origin, mother, father, brother, mm-hmm. sister, the earliest learning classroom is our family of origin. Mm-hmm. 
and and how has that impacted the way I bring myself into the world now? So we talk about that in story group. We talk about your stories of shalom. When was the time that you experienced the goodness of God, the richness of God? Um, often that's people and places. Mm-hmm. So it's shalom shattered. We have a week that we talk about how evil does the work of killing faith, hope, and love mm-hmm. in our own mm-hmm. stories. Mm-hmm. And so if we don't do that work, um, you know, a lot of Christians walk around with giant heads and shriveled hearts. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Um, because they're not integrated. Mm-hmm. And so they can sit into a Bible study and no doctrine, right. but then it doesn't impact how, how is my relational world? Right. You know, and, and how have I been shaped? What have been the factors that have made me who I am today? Well, I'll just tell you right now, listen, I don't know nothing about nothing, but <laughs> I'll take this right now. You know, I think that I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. I think that it's so much easier, whether you're talking about on academic level, a uh, biblical level, whatever it is you're learning, it's much easier to just insert the knowledge into your brain Mm -hmm. than to let it settle into truly transforming you or uh, or helping Mm -hmm. you understand who you are. Mm -hmm. And so we just keep everything up there. Right. And we don't allow it to get into like who we are and, and who, who is God and who is he to us and how does that affect us? Okay. So my next question is this, at what age can you start to examine your story? Because, you know, here I am at 53 and probably over the last six years or so have really begun to do some, some of this harder work, but is this something you can begin to do as a teenager or do you need to wait until you've got a little bit more life behind you? I think at some level, I mean, you can, but you're not going to probably have the fullness of it until you're a young adult. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think college students being able to, um, identify, you know, what are the, their story connected to their passion, connected to their future vocation. I think that's an important thing of, you know, why, why have I chosen the career path that I've chosen? Well, it's connected to my story. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It's connected to my story. And so recognizing just that burden of, you know, creating environments where people can be honest and known and real. Um, and that's connected to my story. And so I think, uh, college age, is important, but definitely as you get into adulthood. Yeah. Well, because, you know, you don't want to ask a 16 year old, tell me about your family of origin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You they might don't not get a yeah, real honest, exactly. mature answer. Yeah. yeah. You can ask, you can ask a 16 year old, what's it like living with your mom and dad? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and getting that data and getting that yeah. feedback, I think is important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, listen, nobody gives us the tools. I, d- I don't recall. I, d- I literally do not recall until the last six, seven, eight years, anybody ever asking me these type questions and helping me understand wh- who I am and, and why am I doing what I'm doing? Right. And, and then how does that fit into the greater right. picture? I've never, right. ever mm-hmm. considered that. Yeah. So when we think about um, why am I so driven towards performance or um, why do I have such an obsession with people pleasing or, you know, all of those are connected to our story. Yeah. And so when we realize and do that work, if we don't tell our story, our story will tell us if we're not aware of, gosh, these are the things that have shaped me. These are the ways that I dealt with emotion or conflict or Uh, you know, my sense of self Mm -hmm. growing up, the messages, a lot of story work is recognizing the agreements we've made in our story. Mm. And what that means Mm. is, you know, the enemy evil will use the message. You don't have what it takes. Mm. Um, You know, you're never going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Um, And if we're not aware, those can drive. I mean, you know, the CEO that is driven to success uh, is often not driven because of the, the company is driven to please dad who he's never been able to get validation from, right. you know, so there is that part of understanding where does all this come from? Right. And I think the uniqueness is in, 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 you know, evangelical circles is that we tend to not have as many environments for that. 
And therefore, I, I, I would argue we're not as emotionally healthy as we mm-hmm. need to be. Mm-hmm. Well, all the people said amen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I hear you say a lot, if we don't tell our story, our story tells us. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I generally know what that means, but will you just elaborate on that and uh, good and bad? Like, what does that look like when our story tells us and what, what is the, the purpose and the benefit in learning to tell our story? What are we, what are we avoiding practically there? Yeah, great question. I think uh, recognizing that there are impacts that we have currently that, that are tied to those past events. So you take a moment of shame you know, in, in our story, often the more subtle something is the more satanic because we go, gosh, it wasn't that big a deal. You know, it wasn't that big a deal that I struck out and won the base and lost the baseball game. And my teammates, you know, made me feel ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's not that big of a deal, but often the more subtle, the more satanic. And we say, well, it's not that big of a deal, but that's where evil will use that moment to say, I'll never do that again. You know, so I will, I will make sure that I will prove myself in every environment. And so if, if we're not, it's a lot of it is the, the energy and how we relate, you know, you may see somebody that, um, never really feels like they listen to anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember years ago, I was meeting with a client and, and they talked that you couldn't get a word in. They, they would talk, 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 talk. And so after, you know, several sessions and you build an alliance with that client, you're not going to do this the first session, but after several sessions, giving that person an observation of saying, I noticed that you never pause and you never, it's like an hour long monologue. It's like, I'm not even in the room. Help me understand where is that coming from? And this person said, she thought, and then she said, "I, I think when I was growing up, I I realized I didn't have a voice. And so the way that I learned to be heard was to be verbose. The way I learned, I will get your attention and I will talk and I will make sure that you see me. And that's an example. If, if, Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the connection, you see you're doing that right now presently in this room. And, and that's something that is, it's flesh driven, not spirit driven. It's a way of demanding with a clenched fist that says, I will be heard. And so someone could go their whole life and not get that feedback of where, where is your domination of conversation coming from in your story? And then that illuminates so many other things. Yeah, yeah that illuminates. And they go back and they go, oh, my gosh, I, I did that growing up. That was the way I had to get mom and dad to listen to me was to talk and talk and talk and talk. Because otherwise they would ignore me, you know? And so, wow. so that's a small example, mm-hmm. you know, I think for, for all of us just in settings in you know, in leadership and all, all those ways of realizing who I am today is not formed in a vacuum. Who I am today is the culmination of experiences, people, um, wounds, brokenness. And, and we have to be willing to understand that. Pete Scrizzaro, who wrote The Emotionally Healthy Church, he says, we cannot be spiritually mature until we're emotionally mature. Oh, oh. that's profound. You know, yeah. and, and I think. And that's where we're lacking. That's where we're lacking. Mm. Yes. And that's why yeah. we have, um, you know, typically we have. And again, I'm, I, I'm all for doctrine and the study of God. Um, I have a degree in theology. I mean, I'm all for that. But I think. Um, the, the, the downside is it never creates an environment that we're able to say, you know, how do I bring my, my face into the world and where is that connected to, you know, it didn't just happen in a, in a vacuum. It happens in some sort of way. And so in order to be a healthy person, I've got to know what are the things that are driving me? What are the, you know, um, what are the messages that I've adopted that are not of God? Mm-hmm you know, that I've adopted as a result of my story. Um, so, yeah. And I would hope and expect that there's good and not just bad. You know, we, Always good. We think yeah. about looking back and, you know, you mentioned yeah. wounding. I mean, I, I just kind of tense up when I think, yeah. and, and I am coming to a story group. I've, I've mm-hmm. told you both I want to do that. But there is a little bit of fear and apprehension of mm-hmm. having to deal with some things, which yeah. tells me I need to do it. But 
you know, how, how does the balance of good and bad come into play? Like what, say, say something that makes us want to do this. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Stories are hard and horrible and they're Mm -hmm. painful and difficult with sharp edges and they are, but surely there's some good. No, it it can't be that. And it's not that. So, and the um, healing is worth it. We want the healing, but, but there's also hope leading through. So I think within a story group, that's, that's a portion of it, but it can't be all that because that would be futile. Right. Um, There is, so uh, there's a portion where we talk about your stories of shalom. And so when we think of shalom, it is when the world was right, when all was good. That's happy. And, you know, so being able to look back and say, like my grandparents' farm was a place of shalom. Aww. It was a place of goodness and peace and love. And, you know, who are the people and who are the places? Often people will say, you know, my grandfather or my coach or, you know, my this significant person in my life. So you're taking time to name that within your story. Also, you're really taking time within the story group to say, God, what does redemption look like in my story? Mm. That's beautiful. So that's the, that's the positive part, but, but you can't, you can't name what you don't know, you know? And Mm. so we can't say, okay, I'm going to move towards this person with redemption. If we're not willing to name where the harm has happened, you know? That's the hardest part though. That is. I mean, I learned that, you know, just yeah. naming. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. No. I mean, Angela's heard me use this um, illustration before because it was the illustration that was for me in that moment was, you know, if if it if, if my life felt like, and, and it was and still is to a degree, just a lot of shattered glass right. on the ground, and then you look at it, it's, everything's broken you've got to start somewhere right. and you pick up a piece mm-hmm. and that can be, you know, that can be just extremely difficult to right. just recognize. I need to take this step. I need to right. pick up this piece of glass and name it yeah. and then, f- and be okay, you know, handling it mm-hmm. and flipping it around. And I may get cut a little bit here and there. That is very, very difficult. And so you know, I am one of those people that before we hit stop on this podcast, this particular recording, I want to make sure that we very practically mm-hmm. tell people, give some ideas, some thoughts, some steps on this naming, mm-hmm. this naming of pain, this this naming of brokenness. And I think you've already alluded to it, but if we can just go back just just a minute and mm-hmm. and. If if I'm sitting here listening to you for the very first time and I know nothing about what it is you're saying, then how do I name? How do I how do I identify some brokenness? Let's go back and talk about that just a little bit more because mm-hmm. that's where I'm going to stop. Because like even right now, I get a little bit of anxiety because I I still know I've got a lot of broken pieces. Mm-hmm. They're laying on the ground that I don't want to pick up and identify mm-hmm. what they are. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one, we don't just want to do that for the sake of doing it. We're not just doing analysis in order to, you know, um, go back to these dark places or whatever, but we are wanting to live honestly before God and others. I mean, I think about the prophets uh, in Isaiah says, tell us smooth things, Mm. tell us easy things. The nation was saying to the prophet. We don't want to hear hard things. Mm -hmm. And God is always dealing with our realities. God is always saying, no, here are the hard things. And you, you can't uh, know those and, and seek redemption uh, until you're able to be able to say, here's where I am. And, and that's done in light of redemption. That's done in light of healing. I, I don't know where to cauterize the wound unless I know where you're bleeding. Mm hmm. You know, so there is that view towards redemption and it is hard. One of my favorite illustrations is in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, um, Lewis, C.S. Lewis's book, that you think about um, Eustace. Eustace was this little punk boy <laughs> that becomes who he was on the inside. He becomes a dragon. And he's trying so hard to get these dragon scales off. Mm. And he's scratching and he's scratching and he can't do it. But it was only when Aslan comes. And he said, Aslan pierces his skin and Eustace feels like he's going to die. 
But it's only then, it's only Aslan who can remove the scales and he removes the scales and Eustace thinks he's going to die. It feels like he's going to die. And then he throws him in the water and he's clean and he's free. And so I think that's the move of redemption of being able to say, you know, we're not just dredging up the dead cat. Mm -hmm. That's that's not fruitful. Mm -hmm. But we are saying, no, I still, those broken pieces are still there. Mm -hmm. And God wants to take those broken pieces and make something more beautiful than it was before. Mm -hmm. You know, in the ancient Chinese art, there is this brokenness that's remade into something more beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's an actual field of art within Chinese art, you know, so God's wanting to take those shattered pieces and put something together that looks beautiful to his glory. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so practically I I think being able to know one, it's a process, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it may take years. Sometimes it may take decades. Um, Secondly, I think it's biblical. I mean, you think, you know, we look at the Psalms and we see David saying, God, this is what I'm feeling inside. My enemies are overcoming me and you're not listening to me and you're turning your face from me and you're hiding from me. So there's this honesty that we can live before God, um, knowing that he doesn't turn away from that, you know? So that's a real practical thing. Um, And it's also practical to say, like, do you want to be well? You know, and part of, you know, living, flourishing is to say, you know, these are areas that need to be mended. Mm -hmm. You know, these are areas that need to be changed. And uh, and so when we do that work, we become more whole. Um, We become more willing to, you know, we become powerful people in the lives of others. We become healthy people who can when you think about what organizations look like that are run by healthy people right. and what they look like that are run by unhealthy people. Right. You know, so ultimately the goal is towards redemption and wholeness mm-hmm. and it is scary. And the crazy thing is, is we shouldn't be afraid of it. Knowing no. if we know who God no. is, but I also know I've done this for 10 years at fellowship and I know that most people will say, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And then, Mm -hmm. and then you just go, just, just come Mm -hmm. for six weeks. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything. Just come for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I would say a vast majority, and it's not because of me, it's because of the content. A vast majority say this changed my life. Yeah. How could it not? Yeah. And then there, then there are people, there are people that after the first or second week, very often after the second week, which is family stories, they Mm. say, I can't do this. Yeah. Oh, listen. And so I I say (laughs) blessings. I mean, it's, this is not about me, you know, and, and I know there's just people that say it's just too hard, but my question for those people would be to say, what is the, what's the damage going to be if you don't name Mm -hmm. the brokenness? Mm -hmm. We carry it with us. Yes. We can't be afraid yeah. of the thing that yeah. sets us free. Or you compensate. You say you make a vow and you say, I will I will I will not let anyone hurt me. Yeah. And so then you live with self protection. Yeah. You know, you live guardedly. Yeah. You know? Because you've been hurt and you don't take risk with people relationally. And so there is a damage to that. And there is hard parts of that, but it's always with that view of restoration. That's God's work. And that's why we do the work of story. It's not just navel gazing. It's not just, you know, going and, you know, talking about all these wounds and I would say, no, that impacted me. Yeah. I tell you, life is messy and it's complicated and it's complex. I wish I listen. I don't know. Maybe it does happen. I have no idea. Um, I wish that there was more opportunity for these types of discussions beginning on the high school level mm-hmm. um, because it's a shame and it's so much harder. It's so much harder because you've just got more years mm-hmm. behind you if you start this in your 40s, right. you know, but just being able to understand mm-hmm. who you are right. and who you're becoming beginning in high school Mm -hmm. and into college and as a young adult is just, it could be life changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I would, I would hope that, um, I don't know, in the context of churches and possibly even schools Mm -hmm. and, you know, that just 
they begin to embrace um, this idea Mm -hmm. and not just wait until you feel like the entire train is off the track and, oh my gosh, what do I do? And something as simple, Fran, is having curiosity about somebody's life. It's that, I mean, that's hard, but it's also like, do we have a deep curiosity about, I mean, I have three daughters, Mm -hmm. you know, and very regularly, you know, Hey, I'm upset. Yeah. So instead of just going, well, you shouldn't be upset or trying to fix being upset, Mm -hmm. being able to go, well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. I have a curiosity. What happened today? Mm -hmm. Well, this happened today. Well, let's, let's dig into that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, let's have this open space to be able to say, you know, well, how did that make you feel? Well, it made me feel, you know, embarrassed or it made me feel stupid or, you know, and so just having a curiosity about the life of another. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think in our culture, we do not have most Mm -hmm. people, most people are not, they, they, they're so consumed with self. Mm -hmm. We're too busy. Yeah. And we're too busy. Or Mm -hmm. they don't know what to do with what you're about to tell me. Like Mm -hmm. I can be curious all day long. And then all of a sudden something comes out of my child's mouth or a college student's mouth. And you're like, Oh no, I can't, I don't know how to respond to that. So we're just going to skip that part. (laughs) Right. And that's where it really comes in that idea of saying, can we have open handedness to know that for all of us, we, you know, we don't have to live in this energy of, well, I've got to fix all of this, but to just say, you know what, we're all on the journey Mm -hmm. and, and not feeling like we have to live formulaic. And I Mm -hmm. think a lot of Christians Mm -hmm. feel like, give me the five steps and Mm -hmm. tell me what to do to make life Mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Life doesn't work that way. (laughs) My goodness. Wouldn't that be if only. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. What else do you want to tell us about, um, here, let me ask you this. I was Mm going to say, what else do you want to tell us about stories? Um, where do you feel like, um, what brings you, let's, let's, we'll end on a happy note, but first, what brings you concern when you look at the landscape of just everything that you do and all the people that you, um, engage with, where do you find concern? Where do you see concern? Just whether that's culturally, you know, as a society, what, what do you see like, who? could be problematic or maybe it's a trend whatever language you want to call it where 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 do you see red flags yeah i think people are living isolated lonely lives and um i think it's easy to do cultural church mm. i think it's easy to you know i mean we all do i mean what sunday do you mean morning. by that what do you mean by cultural church? i mean come sunday morning and everything's good and we keep the you know the the face on but mm-hmm. all the while our life's a wreck mm-hmm. and our kids are falling apart mm-hmm. and we're struggling with addiction and i'm not saying go shout that from the rooftop but right. do you have one or two safe people that you can right. talk about that with right. you know i think that's mm-hmm. when you ask most people you know do you have one other person in your life that knows mm-hmm. the depth of your reality and most people would say no i don't and so i think that's a that's a a really really um dangerous thing and i'm not saying sunday morning is not the time you know i mean do this experiment somebody comes up and says how are you doing and you go i have terminal cancer and i'm about to die in a week mm-hmm. i mean people mm-hmm. they're not going to talk mm-hmm. to you right. and that's mm-hmm. not the venue for it right. you know it's it is pleasantry and be okay with that to be right. able to say yep how you doing? Good. You know, passing, coming and going from a service on a Sunday morning is not the time for that, but it should be in a smaller group. It should be in a Bible study. It should be in a home group. It should be when there's a smaller group. But but often I find that um, that's even then it's a challenge for people because they say, well, these people don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, well, who are the safe people? Mm -hmm. I don't have anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm. you know, and, and they'll go to a counselor and that's good, yeah. you know, but, um, you know, that they need safety and other relationships. So that, that concerns me. Yeah. That concerns me. I think we live in lonely, isolated lives, yeah. particularly for men. Oh yeah. I think most mm-hmm. men in midlife, mm-hmm. my age mm-hmm. are exceedingly lonely mm-hmm. and, um, and do not have, um, you know, other, other friends, and community. And uh, I think that's uh, problematic. That makes me extremely sad. I want to, I'm going to 
I want to say something to that before we end on the happy note because I was, I was going to say, Fran, was this your happy note yeah, that we're ending on? Mm-mm. So Fran, tell me about why in your story, why do we have to end on the happy note? Tell me about that. Where in your story did you adopt that message? She's a seven on the Enneagram. Yeah, like who wants to end on doom and gloom? Um, okay. So my question, I was talking to Angela and I have a mutual friend, Chesney. Shout out Chesney Knowles if you're listening. Um, and so Chesney's husband, um, I got to be around him a little bit today, and he was talking about he'd gone to a therapy session. Mm-hmm. And I was really proud of him. We were talking about this hard work that he's doing. And I said to him, and I know the answer to this, but maybe my question is, what do we do as people that live lives alongside men? But I said, you know, why, why is this so hard? For a man to open up and be vulnerable. Um, yes, I mean, I have three boys. I I get it. They live in, in a world that is, you know, just suck it up and we're not going to show our emotion and we're not going to talk about our feelings because that shows that we're soft and we're supposed to be strong and able and providers and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but is that just the way it's supposed to be? Like, are we just supposed to go, well, there's that. And, you know, so... What what do we do as females, any female that's listening to this, whether they're thinking about their husband or their sons or just, you know, family members, what do we do to help men be okay? Or I don't know. I just, it makes me sad because I'm the polar opposite of that. So it's just, it just makes me sad. Well, I think just recognizing that um, it is incremental that you can't, Um, you just can't throw a man in the deep end and say, you know, that doesn't know how to swim and say, go swim. You know, it needs to be a graded pool. It needs to be something that incrementally small steps. So I think having that perspective, um, you know, my experience has been, if you give the right set, I've had men for years go through story group and you give them the right setting and, you know, and, and they're there. Um, so some of it is the right setting. Some of it's the right, you know, vulnerability of, of a leader being able to say, um, here's my world. Some of it, you know, is modeled as pastors being able to say, you know, gosh, um, just because we're pastors doesn't mean that, you know, we're, our world is perfect. Um, you know, yeah, we want to have maturity or, you know, we, we, who would want to follow someone that, you know, is not mature, but that doesn't mean that there's not still struggles, Yeah. Mm-hmm. you know? So I think just being able to model that, um, see that take place. I, I just think pray, you know, um, I, I don't think, I think the worst thing you can do as a wife or a spouse is to like get in control mode, mm-hmm. you know? Cause I think that when men feel controlled, they're going to go, no, I'm out, yeah. you know, I don't, you know, control me, uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, that's part of our own brokenness, you know? And, uh, so I, I think just, you know, being patient, um, you know, praying for those opportunities for men, um, you know, just also knowing that, you know, intimacy looks different uh, for men than it does for women at some level. Um, and, you know, just giving space for growth in that way. I think all of those are important. You know, and then, and maybe asking questions of, you know, asking your husband or spouse or, you know, tell me about what your world is like. Tell me about, I mean, key questions, Mm -hmm. you know, what are the things you're struggling with right Mm -hmm. now? You know, what feels hard about your life? Mm -hmm. You know, just having those kind of curiosity questions, Mm -hmm. you know, very often I think, and I think the misnomer is that men don't feel that because they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, they do. And, you know, I use this example with men, you think about the most, um, uber masculine alpha male, uh, Navy seal, the military has extensive research that what are the two things that that Navy seal, that special ops, what are the two things he needs in his life so that he doesn't experience intense PTSD? Well, first of all, he needs to talk about what he experienced and the emotion of it in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And he needs to stay connected to it, the men in his platoon. Wow. The military has extensive research on those two things. And if those two things can take place, men, the, the likelihood of PTSD goes down significantly. Wow. So we know uber masculine, you know, right. Navy SEAL, they need to talk about what's yeah. going on in their inner world, in their yeah. emotional world. Um, but often, you know, that's a process. 
yeah. uh, for men. And, and I think we do a disservice. We talk a little bit about that here at fellowship. I think we do a disservice in creating men's environments that if you're not a hunter or fisher, right. you know, um, I think we play sometimes into the stereotype of masculinity mm-hmm. and I think that's wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not mask masculinity has nothing to do right. with deer hunting right? <laughs> or what kind of truck you drive. Right. Even in West Tennessee, even in West Tennessee. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. That's good. Okay. Here's, here's, here's how we're going to end it. Remember okay. it's going to be happy. And it's going to be happy. So happy, you, happy, happy, happy. Um, so you've got to you've got to be hopeful. You've got oh, to be hopeful yeah. in this very hard work that you do. Yeah, I'd go sell insurance if I <laughs> if I wasn't. If, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm super hopeful, and here's why: is because I have the privilege of sitting on the front front row of people's lives yeah. and seeing um, lives changed, of seeing people, you know, enter into realms that they've never entered into make connections within their life. Um, and so I am exceedingly hopeful mm-hmm. as you look out this window right here. Do you see that tree right mm-hmm. out there? Yeah. yeah. I, I call that my hope tree. Oh, and the reason beautiful. is, yeah, the reason is, you know, you look right out and you see that yeah. and it reminds you God is working. He's restoring. Yeah. He's bringing hope. And I wouldn't do this work if I didn't deeply, deeply believe that. Um, but you know, we've got to be willing to, um, you know, name the, like you said, I mean, just entering in those realities with people and the harm. And, um, that is a calling as well. And it's a holy calling, mm-hmm. you know, as you enter into the trauma stories of mm-hmm. others, as, as you enter into the abuse stories of mm-hmm. others. Um, and yet all with a view towards redemption. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm exceedingly hopeful. Um, you know, I love this work, love this calling and, um, I'm so privileged to be able to do it. Mm, I'm so good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for encouraging us and and just listening and and being who you are in the ministry and the work that you do. I mean, they're <laughs> the Lord. The only reason why He hasn't returned or called us home is He trusts us right. to um, come alongside other people's lives and to minister to them and love them and um, live out the gospel for them. And you do that beautifully. Thank you. So. Thank Press you so on, much. Thank you. My friend, Appreciate Mr. It. Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Forevermore. Forevermore. Okay, Angela, this was fun. So good. It's so good. Everybody has taken notes, and I know they're now just thinking a thousand things, but this is what we wanted out of today's conversation. Mm-hmm. So thank you, everybody, for joining us for another episode of Rambling Through Everyday Life with friend and Angela. We'll see you next time. <laughs>